Preface to the Autobiography of Phineas Pett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Phineas Pett by Phineas Pett. Edited by W. G. Perrin. Preface the manuscript in which phineas pett has recorded the story of his life from his birth in fifteen seventy to the end of september sixteen thirty eight consisted originally of sixty nine uniform quarto sheets of which the fifty second is now lost together with the bottom of the fourteenth the handwriting is that of phineas throughout but marginal references on the first few pages and a note at the end the life of commissioner pett's father whose place he did enjoy have been added subsequently by samuel pepys no doubt when he was making the transcript referred to below the first paragraph is written on a separate sheet which unlike the rest has no writing on the back and is followed by a series of subtraction sums of the form sixteen twelve minus fifteen seventy equals forty two giving the age of phineas for each year from sixteen twelve to sixteen forty from the differences apparent in the figures and ink it is clear that these calculations were made year by year from the time that phineas was forty-two until he reached the age of seventy a close inspection of the internal construction the handwriting and of the ink used leads to the conclusion that the body of the manuscript in the form in which it has descended to us was written up not at short intervals but in sections at comparatively long intervals of time the first and largest of these written apparently in sixteen twelve narrates the events down to september sixteen ten and stops at the word ordered on line fifteen of page eighty below the remainder of that paragraph continues on a fresh sheet in a smaller handwriting and different ink and from that point the ample margin of the earlier pages is abandoned and a small one ruled off with lead pencil the top line of this page is also ruled and from this page to the end of the writing the use of these pencil lines persists the next break is in july sixteen eleven page ninety two where pett reiterates the statement that he was sent for by prince henry another break in the writing seems to occur in september sixteen thirteen and a very perceptible one with change of ink occurs in sixteen twenty five at all april page one hundred and thirty four the final section as indicated by a further change of ink begins in february sixteen thirty one the twenty third of february page one hundred and forty six the various anachronisms observable in the text show that these sections were written up some considerable time after the events occurred thus the references to sir john pennington in sixteen twenty seven and sixteen twenty eight make it clear that the events of those years were not written up before sixteen thirty four from the great accuracy of the dates given which have been frequently tested from contemporary sources it is clear that phineas kept a diary in which events were recorded as they occurred and from which the narrative was compiled he appears to have commenced this diary on going to chatham in june sixteen hundred when precise dates begin to replace the vague about toward the end etc of the earlier paragraphs the narrative stops abruptly in sixteen thirty eight apparently with the sentence unfinished for there is no mark of punctuation after the last word in sixteen forty when the final section seems to have been written pett was an old man and it is probable that having been interrupted at this point the fast gathering troubles of the state diverted his mind from the subject or left him without sufficient energy or leisure to pursue it it will be noticed that towards the end the composition becomes more slovenly and the omission of words more frequent as though the task had become burdensome and the author anxious to have done with it Pepys copied the whole of the manuscript into the first volume of his miscellany with the following preface quote, a journal of phineas pett esq commissioner of the navy and father to peter pett late commissioner of the same at chatham viz 
from his birth about fifteen seventy to the arrival of the royal sovereign by him then newly built at her moorings at chatham transcribed from the original written all with his own hand and lent me to that purpose by his grandson mr phineas son to captain phineas pett End quote. the manuscript afterwards came into the possession of george jackson who was secretary of the navy board in seventeen fifty eight and second secretary of the admiralty from seventeen sixty six to seventeen eighty two sir george ducket he had changed his surname in seventeen ninety seven died in eighteen twenty two and ten years later his library including a very valuable collection of naval manuscripts was sold by auction fortunately the manuscripts were purchased by the british museum after being bought in at the sale the volume number four in which this manuscript was contained becoming additional manuscript ninety two ninety eight a commonplace book additional manuscript ninety two ninety five containing among copies of various naval documents an abbreviated version was purchased at the same time the copy of the autobiography most generally known as the early eighteenth century transcript in the harleian collection harleian sixty two seventy nine it is to this copy that writers usually refer possibly because it is mentioned in the paper published in archaeologia in seventeen ninety six although the garbled extracts there given are stated to have been taken from another copy and seem in fact to have been taken from the original a further reason for the preference generally shown for the harleian copy may be its more modern and more clerkly handwriting the harleian transcript is not a good one it contains few omissions none of great importance but mistranscriptions of individual words are very numerous and have reduced the text to nonsense in several places it may seem strange that writers should be content to quote passages that were evidently incorrect without looking at another copy which was easily to be found but whatever the reason may be the fact is that hitherto the original has remained unidentified as such the best transcript is that made by pepys and even he had difficulty in deciphering some of the words although the handwriting of pett is on the whole very clear and consistent in preparing this edition the pepysian and harleian copies have been collated and the missing parts of the original made good by this means but as the numerous inversions of form and mistakes of reading in these copies have no general interest and are of no authority in presence of the original there is no need to specify them in detail considerable license has been taken with the punctuation of the sentences which is entirely without system in the original and the spelling has been modernized in accordance with the rule of the society but the composition has been left otherwise untouched where some word is necessary to complete the sense it has been added in square brackets and the parts now missing from the original which have been supplied from the transcripts have been printed in italics the legal year in england prior to seventeen fifty two did not commence until the twenty fifth of march and pett usually gives his date by this reckoning but in one or two instances he writes as though the year had begun on first of january and ended on thirty first of december to avoid misunderstanding it may be stated that the dates in the introduction headings and notes are given according to the julian year commencing on the first of january pett invariably wrote and signed phineas but it has been thought better to adhere to the spelling phineas which appears from time to time in documents from sixteen o five onwards and has been universally adopted by modern writers in the introduction an attempt has been made first to trace the rise of the master shipwright as an official of the crown and to consider his relation to the profession of shipwrights generally secondly to trace the origin of the pett family and its ramifications down to the date of phineas's death thirdly to throw additional light on the events narrated in the manuscript from such original sources as are accessible in asking the indulgence of the reader towards the evident shortcomings of this attempt the editor would plead that most of the work 
has had to be carried out under great difficulties in scanty moments of leisure despite the generous assistance of mr vincent redstone of woodbridge whose extensive knowledge of suffolk genealogy has been brought to bear on the problem it has not been found possible to trace the pet family to its original location but it is hoped that sufficient has been done to render this task more easy to some future investigator in conclusion the editor has to thank many friends for the help readily given more especially dr tanner who has read the proofs and given the introduction the benefit of his criticism and mr g e mannering of the london library who has rendered invaluable help in clearing up many obscure points and he is indebted to mrs scott for the loan of the manuscript treatise on shipbuilding referred to in the introduction the editor has also had the great advantage of discussing with mr l g carr lawton the technical questions raised in connection with the prince royal and the sovereign of the seas w g p december nineteen eighteen End of preface. Section one of the autobiography of Phineas Pett by Phineas Pett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section one. Introduction, part one. The shipwrights. It might be supposed that so ancient a craft as that of shipbuilding would have left some trace in contemporary records of its activities the methods of its technique and the personalities of those engaged in it yet although references to ships and shipping are frequent in the records of this country from the earliest times and although the shipwright was a distinct class of workmen at least as early as the tenth century probably much earlier no record of the methods in which he set about the design and construction of ships earlier than the end of the sixteenth century appears to have survived it may be presumed that those of our earlier kings who possessed a navy royal did not rely entirely on the support of the sank ports and of the merchant shipping would include among their servants some skilled man to perform the functions of a master shipwright and if not to design at any rate to look to the upkeep of the king's ships and to watch the construction in private yards of those intended for the royal service but if the clerk of the ships who first comes into notice in the reign of john had any such subordinate his existence before the end of the reign of henry v is not known to us it is however possible that on occasion this duty was performed by the king's carpenters whose principal function seems to have been to keep the woodwork of the royal castles in repair in thirteen thirty seven forty oaks required in the construction of a galley then being built at hull for edward the third under the superintendence of william de la pole a prominent merchant of that town were supplied by the prior of blythe who was directed to hand them over to william de kelm or kelm the king's carpenter the accounts for this galley have not survived and there is no means of ascertaining whether william de kelm had anything to do with the actual construction another galley and a barge were at the same time being built at lynn under thomas and william de melchiburn the accounts show that the master carpenter of the galley was john ketch who was paid at the rate of sixpence a day and had under him six carpenters at fivepence a day six clinkers at fourpence six holders at threepence and four labourers at twopence halfpenny the master carpenter of the barge was ralph at green who received the same rate of pay as ketch neither ketch nor green appear as the king's servants in fourteen twenty one the king's servant john hodgkins master carpenter of the king's ships was granted by letters patent a pension of fourpence a day because in labouring long about them he is much shaken and deteriorated in body and this grant was confirmed in december of the following year on the accession of henry the sixth in fourteen sixteen to eighteen hodgkins had built the Dieu, if not the largest probably the best equipped ship yet built in england with the sale of most of the royal navy on the death of henry v the need for a master carpenter of the king's ships 
must have passed away and no trace of any further appointment of this character has been found for over a century the construction of the regent in 1486 was entrusted by henry the seventh to the master of the ordnance and it seems probable that the design of henri grasse built in 1514 was the work of the clerk of the ships robert brigandin although the superintendence of her building was entrusted to william bond or bound who is described in 1519 as late clerk of the poultry surveyor and payer of expenses for the construction of the henri grasse and the three other galleys it was not until the later years of henry the eighth's reign that steps appear to have been taken to establish in the royal service a permanent body of men skilled in the art of shipbuilding from the earliest times of which records exist it had been the practice to send out agents to the various ports to impress the shipwrights caulkers sawyers and other workmen required for the construction and repair of ships of the royal navy this system was no doubt satisfactory while the merchant ship and the royal ship presented no essential points of difference the latter were indeed often let out to hire for mercantile purposes but when the ship of war began to carry a larger number of guns than the trading ship found necessary for her protection a change that may be roughly dated from the end of the fifteenth century the methods of construction began to diverge and the old system of casual impressment must have tended to become less and less satisfactory so that when henry after remodelling the material of the navy turned at the end of his reign to the improvement of the administration he no doubt saw the necessity of attracting permanently to his service men capable of directing the art of shipbuilding as applied to ships of war in the new channels in which it was henceforth destined to run up to this point the position of the shipwright even of the master shipwright was not an exalted one he was classed among servants and artificers and his pay was made the subject of legislation expressly designed to keep the wages of those classes as low as possible in naval accounts and inventories of the reign of henry the seventh fourteen eighty five to eight and fourteen ninety five to seven mr oppenheim has edited material which illustrates the various rates paid to shipwrights and has pointed out that these rates of pay had remained practically unaltered since the days of henry v an act of parliament of fourteen ninety five laid down the following scale of payments from candlemas to michaelmas master ship carpenter with charge of work and men under him fivepence a day with meat and drink sevenpence a day without meat and drink other ship carpenter called a hewer fourpence a day with meat and drink sixpence a day without meat and drink an able clincher threepence a day with meat and drink fivepence a day without meat and drink holder twopence a day with meat and drink fourpence a day without meat and drink master corker fourpence a day with meat and drink sixpence a day without meat and drink a mean corker threepence a day with meat and drink fivepence a day without meat and drink corker labouring by the tide for as long as he may labour above water and beneath water shall not exceed for every tide fourpence a day with meat and drink from michaelmas to candlemas master shipwright fourpence a day with meat and drink sixpence a day without meat and drink hewer threepence a day with meat and drink fivepence a day without meat and drink able clincher twopence halfpenny a day with meat and drink fourpence halfpenny a day without meat and drink holder penny halfpenny a day with meat and drink threepence a day without meat and drink master corker threepence a day with meat and drink fivepence a day without meat and drink a mean corker twopence halfpenny a day with meat and drink fourpence halfpenny a day without meat and drink this act was repealed in fourteen ninety six but the same scale was fixed in fifteen fourteen by an act that was not repealed until fifteen sixty two 
it will be observed that the highest rate under these acts is sevenpence a day although in several instances in the accounts referred to above a master shipwright was paid eightpence a day when henry the eighth instituted the practice of granting by letters patent an annuity for life to certain shipwrights performing the duty of, of the office known later as the master shipwright he fixed the daily rate upon the basis set forth above but it must be borne in mind that as will be shown later this did not represent the total emoluments of that official who was in effect raised both as to emoluments and status above the class in which he had formerly been placed the first of the succession of officials thus established by henry appears to have been james baker who by letters patent dated twentieth of may fifteen thirty eight was granted as from michaelmas fifteen thirty seven an annuity for life of fourpence a day the lowest rate of a master shipwright or master ship carpenter as he was alternatively called by the acts referred to the entry in the roll is of some interest unlike the later grants this grant is not based upon past services but solely upon services which are to be rendered in the future and the authority for the letters patent is not the usual writ of privy seal but the direct motion of the king per ipsum regum in december fifteen forty four new letters patent were issued in which baker is described as a shipwright and the annuity fixed at eightpence a day in january of the same year peter pett shipwright had by letters patent been granted a wage and fee of sixpence a day for life as from michaelmas fifteen forty three in consideration of his good and faithful service done and to be done from which it appears that peter pett was already in the royal service it is probable that the increase in baker's annuity was intended to mark his superior position in relation to pett the official title of master shipwright does not appear as yet in use for when baker and other shipwrights were in the next year sent by the council at the request of the lord admiral to portsmouth to examine into the decay of one of the ships there they were simply described as masters james baker and others skilful in ships in addition to baker and pett these included john smith robert holborn and richard bull on the twenty third of april fifteen forty eight these three latter under the designation of shipwrights together with richard osborne anchor smith had by bill signed by the king's majesty each of them fourpence per diem in consideration of their long and good service and that they should instruct others in their feats smith and holborn were hardly in the same category as baker and peter pett they seemed to have been skilled mechanics rather than constructors or designers and are not mentioned as having built a ship though this is perhaps due to the scantiness of the surviving records but the fact that the formality of letters patent was dispensed with in connection with this grant is significant bull was however in may fifteen fifty granted twelve pence a day from midsummer fifteen forty nine by letters patent in the usual terms and since peter pett was not granted this higher rate until april fifteen fifty eight in the last year of mary's reign it would seem as though bull's services were rated by edward the sixth more highly than pett's james baker does not seem to have long survived henry the eighth probably he died in fifteen forty nine and bull received baker's annuity since it is not likely that an additional annuity would be created for bull at that time and there is no mention of any reversion in bull's patent little is known of bull or of another master shipwright william steffens who is mentioned in fifteen fifty three and fifteen fifty eight the latter may have been the ancestor of the stevens who built the war spite in fifteen ninety six and contested the place of master shipwright with phineas in fifteen seventy two matthew baker son of james succeeded to bull's annuity the letters patent by which the grant was made are different in form from those above referred to for baker is first granted the office of master shipwright with all profits and emoluments pertaining to it which he is to hold in as ample a mode and form as a certain richard bull deceased or any other had held such office and then for the exercise of this office 
he is granted the usual annuity of twelve pence a day for life as from lady day fifteen seventy two in january fifteen eighty four baker attended personally to the exchequer and of his free will surrendered this grant in exchange for one in similar form made out to himself and john addy with reversion to the longer liver the reason why baker thus formally adopted addy as his successor do not appear however baker outlived him dying in sixteen thirteen whereas addy died in sixteen o six at deptford where he was then the master shipwright in july fifteen eighty two peter pett had appeared at the exchequer and surrendered his patent of fifteen fifty eight receiving in exchange a joint patent in similar terms for himself and his eldest son william who was already in the royal service as a shipwright with reversion to the longer liver william however died in fifteen eighty seven two years before his father so that the annuity never reverted to him in his will he describes himself as one of her majesty's master shipwrights and from the reference to him in the patent above referred to it seems probable that he held the office in fifteen eighty four in fifteen eighty seven richard chapman received a grant of the office of norpegiarius which was to be held on similar terms to those in which peter pett and matthew baker or any other held like office but the annuity granted with it was twenty pence a day and not the usual twelve pence apparently this was an additional post created especially for chapman and the twenty pence indicates the rise that had by that time taken place in the shipwright's rates of pay in july fifteen ninety joseph pett was granted twelve pence a day from midsummer presumably this was the annuity that had reverted to the exchequer on the death of his father in fifteen eighty nine his brother william who had held the reversion of it being already dead but the patent contains no reference to this the grant being based upon his good and faithful service done and to be done in building our ships unlike those issued to matthew baker and chapman this patent contains no reference to office and is in the earlier form phineas states joseph's succession to his father's place as master shipwright in fifteen ninety two but this is evidently incorrect in april fifteen ninety two chapman died at deptford and william bright one of the assistant master shipwrights succeeded to his post and annuity of twenty pence in july sixteen o three edward stevens who was a private shipbuilder of some importance obtained a grant by letters patent in terms that differ from those hitherto noticed in consideration of service to be rendered in the future he is granted an office of master shipwright for life which office he is to have and exercise directly one becomes vacant in as ample a manner as matthew baker william bright and joseph pett or any other had held it together with an annuity of twenty pence a day for his services finally the patent concludes by declaring that no one else shall be admitted to such an office until after stevens has been duly appointed and installed this was the patent that gave phineas such great discouragement it is drawn up in due form and it is difficult to understand on what grounds it can legally have been set aside the patent granted to phineas in 1604 did not revoke it it was not recalled and it would appear that it was in virtue of this same patent that stevens was finally admitted as master shipwright in 1613 however phineas by the all-powerful influence of the lord high admiral managed to get it set aside in his favour on the death of his brother joseph in sixteen o five by reason the fee was mistaken wherein his majesty was abused and charged with an innovation the innovation was evidently the grant of a general reversion it would have been interesting to see the arguments laid before the council by stevens when as phineas tells us he contested the decision but unfortunately all the council registers from sixteen o three to sixteen thirteen perished in the fire at whitehall in sixteen eighteen there is little wonder that stevens who was an older man and had one would imagine superior claims bore a grudge against pett stevens appears to have been appointed as master shipwright in the vacancy caused by the death of baker in sixteen thirteen in sixteen fourteen he was master shipwright at portsmouth 
and was in sixteen twenty one serving with phineas as his fellow master shipwright at chatham where he died being succeeded by henry goddard in sixteen twenty six on the twenty sixth of april sixteen o four phineas by the assistance of the lord high admiral obtained the grant by letters patent of two chances of the reversion of an annuity of twelve pence a day either that of baker addy or that of his brother joseph his brother was the first to die and at the end of the following year phineas succeeded to the annuity that had been in the hands of the pets since fifteen forty four it is of interest to note that the patent was not of itself sufficient to enable the patentee to enter into the office of master shipwright the lord high admiral's warrant was also necessary a specimen of such a warrant has been preserved in the state papers in the case of goddard who succeeded stevens in sixteen twenty six having held a reversion by patent since sixteen twenty and runs as follows Quote, whereas we have received certain knowledge of the death of edward stevens late one of his majesty's master shipwrights and the necessity and importance of his majesty's service requireth another man to be presently entered in his place and forasmuch as the bearer hereof henry goddard is authorized by his majesty's letters patents to execute the next place of a master shipwright that should become void by death or otherwise and in regard we have had good experience of the sufficiency and honesty of the said henry goddard and that the said place of one of his majesty's master shipwrights is granted to him by his majesty's letters patents under the great seal of england these are therefore to will and require you to cause the said henry goddard to be entered one of his majesty's master shipwrights with such allowances as is usual hereof we require you not to fail and for you so doing this shall be your warrant dated the sixteenth of september sixteen twenty six j coke to our very loving friend peter buck esquire clerk of his majesty's check at chatham or his deputy End quote. the lord high admiral's records have long since disappeared and in the state papers for the period with which we are concerned very few documents remain of the bulk of naval records that must once have existed this one is therefore of considerable interest on account of the light which it throws upon the very independent position of the lord high admiral in relation to the crown it may be doubted whether any other great officer of state was in a position of such authority that he could presume to ratify a grant that had already passed the great seal at the time when phineas became a master shipwright the ordinary wages of the post paid by the treasurer of the navy were two shillings a day to this was added the exchequer fee or annuity of twelve pence or in the case of bright twenty pence a day besides these matthew baker received a pension from the exchequer of forty pounds a year granted by writ of privy seal said to be in recompense of his service after the building of the Merona, a concession that at a later period was extended to phineas thus at that period the total yearly emoluments of matthew baker were ninety four pounds fifteen shillings of bright sixty six pounds eighteen shillings and fourpence and of phineas pett fifty four pounds fifteen shillings while the east india company paid borough their master shipwright two hundred pounds after making allowance for the difference in the value of money at the beginning of the seventeenth century and its present or rather pre-war value it is clear that these were inadequate emoluments for so important a post and it is not surprising that many of the master shipwrights kept private shipbuilding yards while all added to their income at the expense of the crown in ways that were very irregular and constantly gave rise to scandal probably none was more adept at this art than phineas himself in addition to the master shipwrights receiving an additional allowance from the exchequer under letters patent who seem to have been known as the principal master shipwrights there were others who although they were never fortunate enough to succeed to an exchequer annuity performed the duties of the post to which apparently they were admitted by warrant from the lord high admiral before their reversions under letters patent fell due 
In this category were William Pett and Addy. The relationship between the Royal Shipwrights and the commercial shipbuilders was at all times very close. Not only did the former engage freely in commercial business, but they joined the latter in attempting to regulate the shipbuilding industry of the country. An undated petition of both classes of shipwrights for incorporation occurs among the state papers of 1578. No answer seems to have been given to it, but as there is a brief of patents for shipwrights dated 1592 mentioned in the calendar of Salisbury manuscript, it is clear that the proposal subsequently received consideration, although the matter did not come to fruition until thirteen years later. All record of the steps that preceded the grant of the Charter of 1605 appears to be lost. It is not probable that the aged Nottingham would have moved in the matter without strong pressure from below, and we can only surmise that the officers of the company, thereby incorporated, were the prime movers in the agitation which led to its being granted. It will be observed that the petition of 1578 is based upon the alleged need for regulating the pay, discipline, and training of the ordinary shipwrights, now increasing rapidly in number with the increase of the mercantile marine. The arguments for granting the Charter of 1605, as set forth in the preamble, are two. First, that all ships, both royal and merchant, were built neither strongly nor well. Secondly, that many of the shipwrights were not sufficiently skilful. The remedy proposed for this state of affairs was the formation of a corporation or trade union, of which all persons engaged in shipbuilding in England and Wales were to be compelled to become members. The government of the corporation, and therefore of the whole shipbuilding industry of the country, was placed in the hands of a master, four wardens, and twelve assistants. Baker, as the most noted shipbuilder of the period, was rightly made the master, and wardenships were divided between the remaining two master shipwrights and two of the most prominent private shipbuilders. The twelve assistant ships were divided as follows, Phineas Pett, Addy, and Apslin, from the Royal Dockyards, four shipbuilders of the neighbourhood of London, and one each from Woodbridge, Ipswich, Bristol, Southampton, and Yarmouth. The omission of any representative from Hull or Newcastle is noteworthy. No record remains to show what effect this charter had, probably very little, if one may judge from the absence of any record of complaints against it, although the documentary remains of the first ten years of James I's reign are so very scanty that no great reliance can be placed upon this argument. In 1612 another charter was sealed. The necessity for this was based on the ground of the insufficiency of the powers granted by the former charter, and no pains were spared to remedy this, so far as words could do so. The charter of 1605 extends over five and a half membranes of the patent roll, each membrane about thirty inches long and containing ninety lines of writing. The Charter of 1612 was a portentous document. Its enrolment extends from membrane 16 2 to membrane 37, and contains about 15,600 words. No possible loophole was left of any verbal quibble or evasion on the part of those who might desire to escape from its jurisdiction. The all and every person and persons being shipwrights or carpenters using the art or mystery of shipbuilding and making ships of the earlier charter sufficiently explicit one would have thought becomes all and every person and persons being shipwrights caulkers or ship carpenters or in any sort using exercising practising or professing the art trade skill or mystery of building making trimming dressing graving launching winding, drawing, stocking, or repairing of ships, carvels, hoys, pinnaces, quayers, ketches, lighters, boats, barges, wherries, or any other vessel or vessels whatsoever used for navigation, fishing, or transportation. And to this is added another long clause covering accessories made of wood from masts downward. The other clauses of the earlier charter are also expanded with the like object, and there are several new ones. 
deputies were to be appointed in every convenient and needful place to see that the ordinances of the corporation were properly carried out and to collect dues members might be admitted who were not shipwrights the admission of apprentices was regulated dues were to be received on account of all ships built the secrets of the art were to be kept from foreigners power was to be given to punish those who forsook their work or became mutinous the corporation was granted the reversion of the post of surveyor of tonnage of new built ships and was to examine each new ship to see that it was properly built with two orlops at convenient distances strong to carry ordnance aloft and allow and her foresail and half-deck close for fight provision was to be made for the poor and finally no doubt on account of the extended powers granted the ancient liberties of the sink ports was expressly reserved to them the provision for the armament of the merchant ships is of especial interest when it is remembered that in this year the royal navy reached the low water mark of neglect and inefficiency while piracy in british waters reached a high water mark of efficiency that promised the speedy extinction of the peaceful trader but if the general trend of the new charter was the enlargement and consolidation of the powers of the corporation there is one significant change that led in the opposite direction the shipwrights of england became the shipwrights of redrith in the county of surrey a step so retrograde that it is difficult to imagine what possible argument could have been adduced to justify such a change some reason no doubt there was but owing to the loss of the records it has not been possible to discover it it will be observed that although the master under the new charter was a government official the wardens reduced to three in number were all private shipbuilders and only three of the sixteen assistants were in the service of the state in the year following the grant of the enlarged charter the legal position of the corporation was further strengthened by the issue of an order in council authorizing the master and wardens to apprehend all persons using the art of shipbuilding contrary to the charter and all apprentices or journeymen departing unlawfully from their masters and by an order of the lord high admiral directing the apprehension of all persons who refused to conform to the regulations and their imprisonment until they complied they being chiefly poor men and unable to pay a fine the fact that it was necessary to recapitulate two of the penal clauses of the charter throws light on the uncertain scope possibly the illegality of the powers intended to be conferred by it the active life of the corporation was one long struggle to enforce its powers and secure its rights not only against private individuals or rival bodies but even against the officers of the crown who might well have been expected to respect the provisions of its charter for the resistance to the corporation did not come from poor men alone the other associated bodies of shipwrights that were in being resented interference in their own localities the most important of these was the london civic company known as the company or brotherhood of free shipwrights of london which had been in existence as a tradecraft or guild from an early date it is mentioned among the civic companies in fourteen twenty eight and was in fourteen fifty six erected into a fraternity in the worship of st simon and st jude and in fourteen eighty three regulations were made by it relating to apprenticeship and use of good material and workmanship this company held a very obscure position among the minor companies of the city and during the period in which its activities concern us it seems to have been in a very low financial condition this however did not deter it from contesting the jurisdiction of the corporation or foreign shipwrights as it termed them despite the fact that owing to the growth of london it had itself long left the boundaries of the city's liberties and now had its headquarters near ratcliffe cross and the city not unnaturally jealous of its own special privileges supported the opposition at first the efforts of the free shipwrights of the city to dispute the authority of the corporation were unsuccessful an attempt made in sixteen thirty two ended in the submission of the two citizens who had been put up to contest the matter and their promise to be obedient to the shipwrights of rotherhithe saving the freedom of the city of london 
a submission brought about by the fact that they were members of both companies although they had endeavoured to deny that they were members of the incorporated company of rotherheim a further attempt in 1637, however, by two other free shipwrights, backed again by the City Corporation, was more successful. The case was referred to Sir Henry Martin, the judge of the Admiralty, who reported to the Admiralty that these London shipwrights, being supported by the countenance of the City, will by no means agree to come under the King's Charter and Government, and to that purpose are resolved to oppose themselves by further proceeding at law. The case was referred back to him by the Admiralty, with the remark that, You have long been acquainted with the said business, and know of what importance it is to have the shipwrights kept under government, which was the ground of the grant made to the company at Rotherheim. Martin finally advised the Admiralty not to grant their request, it being a business so much importing the general good of the kingdom, that all shipwrights should live under a uniform government, as now regulated by the king's charter and the two recalcitrants were committed to the marshalsea where they made their submission nevertheless in october sixteen thirty eight the matter was again brought up coming before the newly appointed lord high admiral upon a petition from the city company and by an order in council of march sixteen thirty nine that company was exempted from the jurisdiction of the new corporation of the suburbs although in view of the fact that the said corporation of shipwrights is of so great importance for the defence of the kingdom and is dispersed not in the suburbs only but over the whole kingdom of england it was declared that this exception ought to be no encouragement to any other society or trade or particular persons to withdraw their obedience to the said new corporation or to make suit for the like exemption which in no sort will be granted the city had won fine words whether in a royal charter or an order in council were of little use without the consistent support of the authorities and this the unfortunate corporation never received the attempt of the ipswich shipwrights in sixteen twenty one to secure its dissolution failed but upon the motion of their member against the patent of the ship carpenters who impose exceedingly upon builders of ships the house of commons ordered that the corporation should not demand or receive any more money by virtue of their patent until it had been brought to the committee of grievances and further order had been taken therein by the house less drastic attacks on the privileges of the company frequently succeeded the exemption from land service was ignored by the earl marshal and the lord admiral in sixteen twenty eight in sixteen thirty one the king's bench indirectly curtailed its powers by prohibiting the lord high admiral from proceeding in matters relating to freight wages and the building of ships and two years later prohibited the company from using its powers of arresting ships thereby preventing the company from getting their suits decided in a speedy way in the court of admiralty and compelling them to contend with the master who proving poor and litigious all that the company can get after long suit is but the imprisonment of his body the east country merchants also opposed its trading privileges and in sixteen thirty four the company found it necessary to appeal to the admiralty for assistance in carrying out its powers in regard to the search and survey of ships and the regulation of apprentices in sixteen thirty five when peter pett was master the difficulties in collecting the dues of the shipwrights and the tonnage and poundage granted for the support of the corporation and its poor became more acute than ever after much argument and reference to sir henry martin the master wardens and assistants were told in sixteen thirty eight to cause their charters to be published and put in execution while the vice-admirals mayors and other officers were charged to assist them in sixteen forty one the right of freedom from impressment and from attendance on juries was again in question and although the decision of the lord admiral was then favourable the troubles of the company still continued for in january sixteen forty two they were petitioning the commons for relief in march sixteen forty five the ordinance to protect the shipwrights from impressment for land service on account of the importance of their trade and the decrease of qualified workmen 
was presented to the lords by warwick the lord high admiral and was approved by them and passed on to the commons for concurrence but it does not appear to have been read in august of the following year warwick again reported from the committee of the admiralty to the lords a report and ordinance concerning the better building of ships and granting privileges to the shipwrights and caulkers to be freed from land service elsewhere described as an ordinance for the better regulation of the mystery and corporation of shipwrights this was agreed to and sent to the commons who read it a first time and ordered it to be read a second time on thursday next come seven night and then dropped it in the meantime the clerk and other officials of the company whose pay was much in arrear were petitioning the house to take such action with the company as would force it to meet their claims while the master and wardens were complaining of individual refusals to pay assessments due to the company this state of affairs was still in evidence in sixteen forty eight when edward keeling the clerk and the existing and late beadles of the company petitioned the lords for relief and asked that the public instruments entrusted to keeling may be disposed of and he be indemnified for them the statement of the wardens annexed thereto explains the situation as follows the wardens had quote, consented to pay the established duties of the corporation as directed by order of the house but peter pett and other principal members and great dealers in that mystery withhold and refuse to pay the duties for support of the corporation and so the wardens have not the means to pay the salaries of their officers or their house rent to relieve the poor to make their due surveys upon ships or to pursue an ordinance for settlement of their government which passed the house of peers eighteen months ago and now remains in the house of commons end quote. in june sixteen fifty the difficulties of the company were evidently still unrelieved for a petition from them together with their charter was referred by the council of state to the committee of the admiralty who were to advise with the admiralty judges on the matter the result of this does not appear but it seems probable that the corporation shortly after ceased to exercise its functions for a petition to the navy commissioners in sixteen seventy two which shows the same old difficulties still unremedied refers to the discontinuance of the exercise of this charter in the late troublesome times during the earlier years of this activity the corporation played a part of some importance in the administration of the navy it surveyed and reported upon the workmanship and tonnage of ships built in the royal yards and gave advice concerning their defects thus acting to some extent as a check upon the master shipwrights and notices of the sale of unserviceable ships were given out at shipwrights hall as well as on the exchange in one instance it was called upon to submit a scheme for the mould of a ship like to prove swiftest of sail and every way best fashioned for a ship of war but this attempt to erect it into a board of design seems to have failed completely in sixteen eighty three the corporation attempted to set its affairs on a more satisfactory basis by obtaining a new charter surrendering the charter of sixteen twelve in october sixteen eighty four and obtaining in january sixteen eighty six a warrant from james the second to renew it with additions this was opposed by its old enemies and nothing seems to have come of it although the matter was under discussion until sixteen eighty eight and the masters of trinity house in sixteen eighty seven in a report to pepys had recommended that there should be but one company of shipwrights and that all of that trade in england should be under their rule and government the corporation appears then to have become practically extinct for in a report by the navy office in sixteen ninety on the method of measuring ships reference is made to the measurement and calculations formerly taken and made by the corporation of shipwrights when there was such a company in sixteen ninety one and seventeen o four the remnants of the corporation made a final attempt at reconstruction backed by the admiralty navy board and trinity house a petition to this end came before the house of commons in january seventeen o five and is recorded in the journal of the house in the following terms Quote, a petition of the master shipwrights who signed the same in behalf of themselves and others master shipwrights of england 
was presented to the house and read setting forth that the petitioner's predecessors were incorporated by charter in 1605 and were thereby empowered to rectify the disorders and abuses of the shipwright's trade and to furnish the crown and merchants with able workmen and to bind and enrol their apprentices but the breed of able workmen is almost lost and for want of sufficient power to execute the good intent of their charter the petitioners have not been in a regular method many years past to rectify the disorders amongst the shipwrights and to improve their trade yet a proposal of some additional heads to effect the same has been approved and reported by the commissioners of the admiralty commissioners of the navy corporation of trinity house and also his royal highness the seventh of november seventeen o four declares his opinion that it will be much for the public service to have the shipwrights incorporated by charter as desired by them but in the said proposal there are some necessary clauses which cannot be made practicable and effectual without an act of parliament and praying that leave be given to bring in a bill of regulating clauses to be inserted in a new charter for the better breeding of shipwrights and for the more firm and well building of ships and other vessels End quote. the motion to refer it to a committee was lost and thus went out the last spark of life of a corporation that had struggled in vain for a hundred years to carry out the intentions of its founders End of section one Section two of Autobiography of Phineas Pett by Phineas Pett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section two. The Family of Pett. When Thomas Hayward, in his description of the Sovereign of the Seas, written in 1637, referred to the author of this manuscript as Captain Phineas Pett, overseer of the work, and one of the principal officers of His Majesty's Navy, whose ancestors as father grandfather and great-grandfather for the space of two hundred years and upwards have continued in the same name officers and architects in the royal navy he was it may be presumed recording the local tradition of the pet family that this tradition was strong and persistent is clear from the fact that mansell writing to thomas aylesbury in sixteen twenty to propose peter pett as builder of the new pinnaces recommended him on the ground that his family have had the employment since henry the seventh's time while forty years later fuller in his worthies of england also referred to it in these words quote, i am credibly informed that that mystery of shipwrights for some descents hath been preserved successfully in families of whom the pets about chatham are of singular regard End quote. This tradition, so far as it relates to the descent of the mystery from generation to generation, was no doubt well founded, but there is no evidence that office under the crown was held by any of Phineas Pett's ancestors earlier than his father Peter. The name Pett is said by a modern writer on the history of English surnames to be a Kentish variant of the name Pitt. This would imply a Kentish origin of the family and this supposition might seem to be strengthened by the fact that the name as a place name only occurs in kent and on the eastern borders of sussex the fact is however that pet is simply a middle english variant of the familiar word pit kin to the old frisian pet and is found in use throughout the east coast counties from sussex to yorkshire but more frequently in the south than in the north in the thirteenth and fourteenth century this surname occurs in the form of at pet or del pet i e at the pit or of the pit which indicates clearly that the bearers had on the introduction of the hereditary surname from the twelfth century onward taken the name pet or had it thrust upon them because they were known as living near to a pit and were thereby distinguished from other walters or adams dwelling on the hearth or by the wood etc a study of the local distribution of this name in the fourteenth century shows that the pit in question though it may occasionally have been a well a saw-pit 
or a pitfall for wild beasts was more usually a place where owing to the absence of stone from the district clay or loam had been dug in forming the walls of the rude cottages in which all but the upper strata of society then dwelt thus one great centre of the pets in suffolk in the thirteenth and fourteenth century the district between thetford and i is a heavy clayland from which stone is absent by the end of the sixteenth century this name in the form of pet pet and pet was common in kent essex suffolk and south norfolk in fifteen eighty three peter pet then master shipwright at deptford obtained a grant of arms from herald's college the original has unfortunately disappeared but from the reference to it in Leneve's pedigree of the knights it appears that he claimed descent from thomas pett of skipton in cumberland through john pett his grandfather and peter pett his father who had been a shipbuilder at harwich the fact that there is no skipton in cumberland shows that this record is hardly reliable as regards the place of origin of the family neither of the existing skiptons neither of the existing skiptons which are both in yorkshire remote from the sea is likely to have given birth to a family of shipbuilders and there is no indication that any relations of the pets were at any time resident in yorkshire or cumberland moreover the name was practically unknown in this period in the north in an attempt to elucidate this matter major bertram raves put forward in the mariner's mirror the suggestion that thomas pett was of hopton in suffolk and that hopton was fudged into skipton by the tudor heralds in the grant of arms to peter pett pets about or near to hepton at the time were yeomen or husbandmen the pedigree may therefore have seemed to need treatment he then goes on to show that pets were established in the neighbouring villages of hepworth wattisfield harling and waltham le willows the pets in wattisford having been in the neighbourhood since the fourteenth century one significant fact is the letter which peter pett the half-brother of phineas wrote to sir bassingbourne gordy of harling in fifteen ninety eight in which he apologises for his delay in visiting him and sends his remembrances to lady gordy and others it is clear from this letter that peter was well known in the neighbourhood and was it may be presumed related to the thomas pett living there at that time but it seems very doubtful whether skipton really was a wilful substitution for or a mistranscription of an original hopton for there is no evidence that any one of the name ever lived at hopton and it seems possible that some earlier pet may have migrated to yorkshire and his descendant john have returned to east anglia of thomas pett nothing is known and of john his son nothing can be stated with certainty in fourteen ninety seven william pett of dunwich left by will quote, to my brother john pett my new boat and all my working tools end quote, a legacy that implies that the brothers were shipwrights it is not improbable that this was the john pett who was engaged in corking the regent in fourteen ninety nine from the entry in the roll it is clear that john was a master workman or shipbuilder for the sum paid him thirty eight pounds one shilling and fourpence is a fairly large amount for that period and covered miscellaneous stores besides the corking of the overlop or deck and the sides of the ship against wind and water unfortunately his account villam suam inde factum is no longer in existence this work was possibly carried out at portsmouth where the regent had been fitted for the expedition to scotland in fourteen ninety seven and where she was again undergoing repair in fifteen o one but there would have been nothing unusual at that period when the resources of the portsmouth district were hardly sufficient in entrusting such work to a shipbuilder from the eastern counties in fourteen eighty five a master shipwright had been sent from london to burlston to superintend the removal of the mast of the grace of the grasse dieu and her entry into dock and shipwrights were frequently impressed from east anglia to work in portsmouth and southampton the work may however have been carried out at harwich where the king's ships sometimes rode with peter the son of john 
we come at length upon sure ground the will he made in march fifteen fifty four is upon record and shows that he was possessed of a dwelling-house and shipbuilding yard at harwich which he bequeathed to his son peter the father of phineas possibly he was the peter pett noted by mr oppenheim as among the shipwrights pressed from essex and suffolk working at portsmouth in fifteen twenty three there can be no doubt that he was the peter pett of harwich who with other shipwrights signed a decree of appraisement of a ship in fifteen forty his son peter pett who died in fifteen eighty nine when master shipwright at deptford entered the royal service some time before fifteen forty four as already noted there is no record of the names of the earlier ships built by him but it is known that in fifteen seventy three he built the swiftsure and the acates and in fifteen eighty six the moon and rainbow all at deptford at the time of his death in fifteen eighty nine he was engaged upon the defiance and advantage which were completed by joseph pett his second and eldest surviving son who as already remarked succeeded to his place as master shipwright his eldest son william pett of limehouse also a master shipwright who built the greyhound in fifteen eighty six having died in fifteen eighty seven peter pett was twice married and had four sons and one daughter by his first wife whose name is not known and six daughters and three sons of whom phineas was the eldest by his second wife elizabeth thornton these will be found set forth in the subjoined tables which will serve to illustrate the relationship between them and the other members of the family referred to in the manuscript peter pett towards the end of his life had achieved a great reputation as a shipbuilder and was as is evident from his will a man of considerable means he died possessed of a house at harwich where he had also built almshouses a house at deptford land at freighting near colchester the lease of a house at chatham and ground presumably a shipbuilding yard at wapping in addition to this property he left twenty pounds to the children of his son richard six pounds thirteen shillings and fourpence to the child of his daughter lydia a hundred pounds each to phineas and his brothers noah and peter and one hundred marks to each of his four daughters by his second wife and to an unborn child that probably did not live the payments to the children of his second wife were to be made on their attaining the age of twenty-four but from the statements of phineas on pages twelve and thirteen it would appear that part of the money was embezzled by the rev mr nunn and part retained by phineas's brother joseph peter pett of wapping the third son of the above carried on business as a shipbuilder in the private yard at wapping which had been left to him by his father he does not appear to have held any office under the crown but seems to have been well known to the lord high admiral for in his letter above referred to he puts off his visit to gordy on the ground that he has to be next sunday with the earl of nottingham at the court of richmond in fifteen ninety nine he published a poem entitled time's journey to seek his daughter truth and truth's letter to fame of england's excellency which he dedicated to nottingham he was also the author of a sonnet in three stanzas of seven lines entitled all creatures praise god it is not necessary for our present purpose to pursue the fortunes of this family further but the reader who is desirous of obtaining information as to the later descendants of peter pett of harwich will find it in an excellent paper in volume ten of the ancestor by mr farnham burke and mr oswald baron entitled the builders of the navy a genealogy of the family of pett end of section two section three of autobiography of phineas pett by phineas pett this librivox recording is in the public domain section three phineas pett from the care that had been taken to provide for his education and from the fact that it was only at the instant persuasion of his mother that he was contented to be apprenticed as a shipwright it may be inferred that phineas had been destined for the church or the law and that peter pett did not propose that his son should follow in his own footsteps 
the peculiarity of the name chosen for him which no doubt refers not to the disobedient son of eli but to phineas the son of eleazar the son of aaron the priest who received the covenant of an everlasting priesthood gives rise to the surmise that his parents had intended him for the church but whatever the intention may have been it was certainly abandoned on the death of his father phineas does not seem to have profited greatly from his studies at cambridge he was hardly a master of english possibly he had a good knowledge of latin for the influence of the latin idiom is to be seen in almost all his periods but the fact that he had subsequently to practise ciphering in the evenings does not imply any great acquirements in mathematics even of the very elementary forms which at that period were sufficient for the solution of the few problems arising in connection with the design of ships nevertheless he received the degree of bachelor of arts in fifteen ninety two and that of master in fifteen ninety five if the statement that he spent the two years of his apprenticeship to chapman to very little purpose is to be accepted literally it would seem that the misfortunes that subsequently befell him must have aroused latent energies and filled him with determination to master the details of his future profession when he returned to england in fifteen ninety four his voyage to the levant and subsequent employment as an ordinary workman under his brother joseph no doubt gave him a practical acquaintance with ships that enabled him to profit greatly by the instruction of matthew baker although apparently this only extended over the winter of fifteen ninety five to six pett's confession that it was from baker that he received his greatest lights written as it must have been after he had found baker an envious enemy and an old adversary to my name and family indicates how great that assistance was this is borne out by a letter which he wrote to baker in april sixteen o three in order to deprecate the old man's wrath which had been aroused when phineas then assistant master shipwright at chatham commenced work on the answer the letter was partially destroyed by the fire which damaged the cottonian library in seventeen thirty one but fortunately pepys had copied it in his miscellanea Quote, sir my duty remembered unto you it is so that i received a message from you by richard merritt the purveyor concerning the answer who gave me to understand from you that you were informed i meant to break up the ship and to lengthen and that i should no further proceed till i received further order from you indeed the ship was heaved up by general consent both of my lord some of the principal officers and two of the master shipwrights which were here present at the time she was begun to be hauled up no determination being resolved upon that should be done unto her for which cause other haste of businesses also being some hindrance she hath lain still ever since till now that it pleased sir henry palmer to command she should be blocked and searched within board only and so let alone partly because our men wanting other stuff to perfect other businesses had little else to do as also to the intent she might be made ready to be the better viewed and surveyed lying upright being somewhat also easier for the ship this is now done but i ensure you there was no intent or other purpose to proceed in anything upon her any further till the master shipwrights especially yourself who built her had first surveyed her and under your hands set down what should be done unto her and therefore good mr baker do not give so much credit to those that out of their malice do advertise you untruth concerning either this or any other matter for it is supposed by whom this hath been done and he is generally thought to be no other than an ambidexter or rather a flat sheet being so far off from either procuring credit to himself by due execution of his place and discharge of his duty that like aesop's dog he doth malice any other that is willing to give him precedent of better course than all men can sufficiently in this place report himself to follow and for myself it is so sure from me to understand anything that you should think any ways prejudicial unto you or to any of your works that you shall always rather find me dutiful as a servant to follow your directions and instructions 
in any of these businesses than arrogant as a prescriber or corrector of anything done by you whose ever memorable works i set before me as a notable precedent and pattern to direct me in any work that i do at any time undertake and you yourself can say setting private jars aside which i hope are all now at a final end but that i ever both reverenced you for your years and admired you for your art in the which i know to speak without flattery no artist in christendom of our profession able in any respect to come near you therefore good mr baker carry but that loving mind towards me you shall find my loving duty to you to deserve who you shall find always as ready to do you any service either in this place or any other as any servant of yours whatsoever among whose rank i account myself one of the most unworthiest for although i served no years in your service yet i must ever acknowledge whatever i have any art if i have any it came only from you thus hoping this shall suffice to give you satisfaction in this behalf i humbly take my leave ever resting ready to do you service your servant phineas pett chatham this tenth of april sixteen o three to the worshipful and my loving friend mr matthew baker one of his majesty's master shipwrights given this at woolwich or elsewhere this expression of opinion upon baker's capacity was evidently quite genuine for many years after when the old man was dead and there was nothing to be feared from his enmity phineas wrote of him as the most famous artist of his time phineas did not rely on his professional skill alone to gain him preferment when in his brother joseph's employment he laid out his earnings in clothing himself in very good fashion always endeavouring to keep company with men of good rank far better than myself by means of a friend thus gained he obtained an introduction to the lord admiral which was the very first beginning of his rising no doubt nottingham had known his father and it is certain that he was well acquainted with his brother peter it is probably to this that the extraordinary respect that the later favours of the admiral were due these favours brought upon him the malicious envy of master shipwrights who were no doubt aggrieved at seeing employment that might have provided them or their friends with pickings handed to a newcomer the post of purveyor of timber was not without its perquisites and pett's thankfulness that nothing could be proved against him when the accounts of his doings in suffolk and norfolk were scrutinized indicates that his labours had not been without some profit to himself indeed his association with trevor who became an able disciple of the arch thief mansell leads one to suspect that falk greville's action in wrongfully cutting off twenty pounds was not the high-handed injustice that phineas would have one believe it is true that mr oppenheim dates the administrative degeneracy of the navy office from greville's treasurership but it is probable that this arose from greville's incapacity to exercise the strict control which had characterized his predecessor hawkins and not from want of integrity three years later phineas affirms that greville continued his heavy enemy because the treasurer could not win him to such conditions as he laboured me in against the surveyor a state of affairs that seems to indicate a half-hearted attempt at reform on greville's part rather than any underhand conspiracy in an anonymous account of the quarrel at chatham in sixteen o two preserved in Peets's miscellanea written evidently by george collins the principal informer and stirrer in this business it is stated that the writer told sir henry palmer that pett quote, had sold away the repulse's foretop mast and that through his negligence the crane was bilged in the dock which cost the queen a hundred pounds whereupon palmer called him a rogue and asked him if he ever stole anything and then struck him with a cudgel quote, and no wonder though sir henry took his part so much for in six weeks after he had great mast soared out into boards at the queen's charge a long-boat full and towed down to whitechapel by boatswain by boatswain gale or his man at a ketch's stern at the term after i served phineas pett upon a battery and sir john and sir henry procured my lord admiral's warrant to send me to marshalsea but that i paid well for it 
in mr pope's house i had gone thither and so was forced to agree with phineas and to enter into bond never to follow suit against him neither for the king nor yet for myself end quote. the writer then goes on to give instances of pett's misappropriations of materials and labour four tons of elm timber sawn into boards fifty deals from the storehouse fifty small spars two four-inch planks to make a bridge into his meadow labour for two or three days a sluice made in the meadow at a cost of three pounds or four pounds two or three tons of oak timber sawn into posts to hang clothes on and painted at the queen's cost although the writer has an obvious grievance against pet there seems no reason to doubt the substantial accuracy of the charges made one of the gravest indictments subsequently brought by the commission of inquiry of sixteen o eight to sixteen o nine against phineas was that relating to the ship which he had laid down in david duck's private yard at gillingham in sixteen o four when both he and duck were shipwrights at chatham from the account of it presented by phineas it might be supposed that the charge related merely to the sale of ordnance and ammunition to the spaniards but the malpractices alleged went much further than that and although pett was cleared by the king an examination of the evidence produced before the commission leads to the conclusion that those scandalous and false informations might have led to very unpleasant results if the king had not been biased in his favour the story as made out from the existing documents is briefly as follows the ship a small one of about a hundred and sixty tons had been built largely of timber delivered for the king's use at chatham and with articles borrowed out of the store under warrant of the principal officers two of whom mansell and trevor subsequently had shares in her she was rigged with the rigging of the foresight which for bare twelve pounds only he bought out of her at much less than the value by the favour of the surveyor trevor and the treasurer mansell so that she was sailed with the king's sails and rigged with the king's tackling when she set sail for spain in sixteen o five under colour of a transporter of my lord admiral's provisions she was furnished out of the king's store with cables anchors flags pitch and other stores and provisions including six hundred weight of biscuit she also drew one hundred and twenty bolts of canvas for the use of the fleet part of which was sold by pett's brother and for the whole of which phineas acknowledged himself responsible although taken up as a transport and paid wages and tonnage on a false rating of three hundred tons about twice her capacity she was entered in the customs as a merchantman bound for san lucar and carried sixty tons of lead for a merchant of london named alabaster for which sixty pounds was received as freight at lisbon pets sold a demi culverin of brass captured at cadiz in fifteen ninety six with ammunition and a quantity of bread biscuit and peas belonging to the fleet for which he received three hundred pounds which he sent by the way of exchange to trevor and mansell then at valladolid with nottingham who had gone there to ratify the peace recently concluded between the two countries altogether the voyage of this ship cost the king eight hundred pounds or a thousand pounds as appeareth by the accounts for little or no service done to all as regards the money sent to valladolid it is probable that this was used in paying some of the expense of the embassy and that this proceeding had the sanction of nottingham but pett's answers before the commission to some of the other charges as given in the signed deposition of twelfth of may sixteen o eight seem rather weak he stated that the riggings of the foresight were found to be so ill that they stood him in little or no stead that the accounts for the provisions were delivered to sir john trevor and no copies had been kept and by a convenient lapse of memory he could not say what persons or stuff were landed at the groin nor what burden the ship was accounted for to the king when asked by captain morgan to set him down on the east side of the groin he was alleged to have said that he could not adventure the ship by his directions so that she was no part of the fleet for that she was no part of the fleet in reply to which allegation he swore that to the best of his recollection no such words were ever used it appears from the evidence that sir richard levison had refused to allow the ship as one of the fleet 
but he had died shortly after the return to england and after his death mansell and trevor assuming full power into their own hands had reversed the decision one reason given by pett for visiting ports other than that to which the fleet had gone is of interest he told the commission that he had been informed by trevor and mansell that the biscuit would not be needed for the fleet by reason of the short voyage my lord admiral had into spain and he was to go to lisbon or san lucar to sell it and that they reported as from my lord admiral that because this deponent was a shipwright he might in the harbours where he should put in take view of the spanish ships and galleys and of the manner of their building with a ship so cheaply built and rigged and employed on such favourable terms it could not have been difficult to make a handsome profit and it is little wonder that pett calls her a lucky ship when he tells of her sale in sixteen twelve the corruption in the administration of the navy which had begun to appear in the last years of elizabeth's reign had by sixteen o eight reached such height that james was at length forced to take some steps in regard to it the knowledge that spain was actively engaged in setting her navy in order no doubt quickened the king into action and provided a motive powerful enough to sweep aside for the time the obstruction of the senile nottingham and his jackal mansell at first it had been intended that nottingham should head the commission and letters patent were passed on first of april sixteen o eight in which his name appears first northampton coming second but for some reason this was altered and on the thirtieth of april a commission under the great seal was issued to henry howard earl of northampton then lord privy seal and lord warden of the cinque ports charles howard earl of nottingham the lord high admiral and thirteen others of whom sir robert cotton the famous antiquary was the most active northampton who was nottingham's cousin seems to have been the leader of the reform party and although he is persistently vilified by pett there is little doubt that he was actuated by a more or less sincere desire sharpened possibly by mutual antagonism between the offices of lord warden and lord high admiral to reform the many existing abuses what all these abuses were would take too long in telling but they were sufficient to justify and more than justify the vigorous language of the patent which speaks of the quote, very great and intolerable abuses deceits frauds corruptions negligences misdemeanours and offences that have been and daily are perpetrated committed and done against the continual admonitions and directions of you our high admiral by other the officers of and concerning our navy royal and by the clerks of the prick and check and divers other inferior offices ministers soldiers mariners and others serving working or labouring in and about our said navy end quote the patent then proceeds to give instructions for the examination of all officials who have been connected with the navy since fifteen ninety eight and the investigation of their accounts quote, minding that the said intolerable abuses frauds misdemeanours and offences shall forthwith be inquired of the offenders therein condignly punished and also to provide a speedy reform of the same for the time to come End quote possibly at the time james really intended to reform the administration nottingham kept out of the way and his subordinates had an unpleasant time while they were examined upon their misdeeds but in the end james's fear of spain having passed away he with his usual weakness let the offenders off with a lecture the commission commenced to sit in may sixteen o eight and sat for a little over a year ending with the proceedings before the king recorded on pages sixty eight to sixty nine below during this period one hundred and sixty one witnesses were examined and their signed depositions taken these are preserved among the manuscript of sir robert cotton who acted as the secretary they were analysed by cotton who drew up a lengthy report in which various abuses are set forth and proposals made for their remedy the latter as might be expected were duly ignored by the king among the offenders cited by name pett appears as one of the chief and although the present occasion is not convenient for a general examination of the report and evidence some mention must be made of the matters in which pett is directly charged with wrongdoing 
the first point made against him is that while he was keeper of the timber store at chatham he had failed to reject bad timber and plank brought in by one of the purveyors his answer to this was that sir henry palmer had been so quick with him for some of these exceptions as he would complain no more though the purveyors brought in faggot sticks he is next charged with certain malpractices in connection with the resistance and other charges on this account are brought against him further on these have already been referred to in a general charge against the master shipwrights that for reasons of private gain ships were repaired when they were not worth the labour nor the charges bestowed on them the case of the victory is cited as an example Quote, thus did the victory for transportation docking and breaking up stand the king in four or five hundred pounds and yet no one part of her at this day is serviceable to any use about the building of a new as was pretended for a colour to conclude though we set her at a rate of two hundred pounds yet it had been better absolutely for the king to have given her away to the poor than to have been put to the charge of bringing her from chatham to woolwich no other use having been made of her than to furnish phineas pett that was the only author of her preservation with the fuel for the diet of those carpenters which he victualled in complaining that estimates for repair were made blindfold with the result that money was spent upon old ships more than sufficient to have built new ones the illustration is again drawn from pett's proceedings Quote, an instance of this art may be drawn from the king's ship now called the anne royal whose estimate being first set down by the master shipwrights at three thousand five hundred and seventy six pounds which sum would have built another by the judgment of those that made the estimate newly from the stocks of equal burthen doth upon her finishing by phineas pett a favourite of the chief officers amount to full seven thousand six hundred pounds upon that false ground which before hath been spoken of End quote. a little further on in dealing with frauds connected with the receipt of stores pett is again made the principal example quote, when timber and other material come to be received into the stores of the clerk of the check combining closely with the deliverers to increase the quantity of that which is delivered some time to a third part above true measure which increase is shared between both and lots are cast upon the robe of the redeemer sir folk greville espying plainly this collusion between parties to the wrong of our great master sought to prevent this play of fast and loose by adding phineas pett to the clerk of the check at chatham as an assistance to take care that there might be no increase of quantities but all things accounted for in their true proportion in weight and number as they were indeed without conspiracy but such was the falsehood of the party as having found the thief he ran with him thrusting himself into the pack with the clerk and the deliverer and thus adding himself as an assistant indeed not to plain dealers as sir folk greville meant but to filchers and abusers as pett himself meant which appears upon examination End quote. in a further charge relating to the issue of material for ships building or under repair it is pointed out that the surveyor had taken away the keys of the storehouses from clerk of the check their proper custodian and put them into the hand of pett his cheap favourite who could not only take just what he liked but likewise hath power to expend upon the ships or under that pretence whatsoever he thinketh good without contradiction and full scope withal to embezzle what he list he is also mentioned in connection with the construction and decay of the pale which should defend the storeyard from pilferers on the outside towards the thames and with the employment of youths and boys that fill up numbers but work little finally he is charged with wasteful and lavish expense in repairing the ironwork of the anne royal at a cost of eight hundred pounds or more than double the amount necessary for the purpose in the only charge to which pett himself refers namely that of altering his lodgings he is not mentioned by name but it is clear that all the resident officials had added rooms to their houses at the expense and to the detriment of the storehouses which adjoined there seems little doubt that these charges were well founded and that pett was acting in collusion with his very good friends mansell and trevor to defraud the state 
it is however probable that the other officers were little better and were only restrained by the lack of those opportunities the possession of which they envied pet it is clear from the remarks in the report of the commission of inquiry already quoted and from pet's narrative that the original intention was to rebuild the victory which had been removed from chatham to woolwich in the autumn of sixteen o six for this purpose the official records do not throw any light upon the circumstances in which this intention came to be abandoned and indeed the treasurer's official accounts for sixteen o nine and sixteen ten preserve the fiction that the victory was rebuilt from the story related by phineas it appears that the victory had been given by james to prince henry and that pett was entrusted with the task of rebuilding her because he was one of the prince's retainers he then conceived the idea of constructing a ship larger than any that his predecessors had built and made a model embodying his design which so pleased the lord high admiral that the king was brought to see it and the result that it was decided to build a new great ship on the line suggested by pett this procedure of constructing a model to scale from the design for the approval of the authorities before starting to build the ship is probably the first instance of the adoption of a course that later became customary in all cases where a new ship represented an advance in size or method of construction or embodied features not to be found in her predecessors her keel was not laid until the twentieth of october sixteen o eight nearly a year after the model had been submitted to the king's inspection in the meantime the commission of inquiry had been appointed and the construction had not proceeded far before questions were raised as to the correctness of the design the suitability of the material and the competence of pet as designer and builder on the fifteenth of december baker was examined on the subject before the commission the questions put to him related to the estimated cost of the prince royal and the material used the cost of the rebuilding of the ark royal and the experience of pet as a builder baker estimated the probable cost of the prince at seven hundred pounds nearly twice what he had been paid for the mer honor this estimate although apparently in excess of one given by pet proved very far short of the mark since the total cost finally came to nearly twenty thousand pounds no less than one thousand three hundred and nine pounds being spent on decoration and carving alone as regards the material baker stated that the timber was very badly chosen it appears that old and unsuitable trees were selected on account of the profit to be made by their larger tops which seemed to have been one of the many perquisites of the officers in preparing the timber there was so baker said quote, so much waste as the charge will be well near half so much more as it needed to be to the king besides the ship will be of many years less continuance serviceable than otherwise she would have been if the timber and plank had been well chosen and framed in the wood End quote. in regard to pet's competence quote, being asked also by virtue of his oath whether phineas pett be a workman sufficient to be put alone in trust upon a ship of so great charge and burthen he answereth that he never saw any work of his doing whereby he should so think him sufficient for that work but rather thinketh the contrary further being demanded what ship he knoweth or have heard the said pett had built or repaired he saith he never knew any ship of his building but one of the one hundred and twenty tons or thereabouts which he built by chatham for himself as far as he knoweth and another ship of the burthen of two hundred and twenty three tons he repaired and a pinnace for his majesty which he saith was so done that after he had repaired them they were worse in condition than they were when he took them in hand for that they were so unserviceable that they would bear no sail by which default of his they were returned from the seas into chatham to be new furred to make them bear sail so that with his first repairing and furring of them he doubts not but it will appear by the attempts that his workmanship with stuff was more chargeable than a new ship of their burthen might have been new built for which are enough to persuade any man that he cannot be sufficient to perform the building of so great a ship when he hath performed the reparation of a small ship so ill 
as of a good ship he made a bad further being asked what his opinion was concerning the choice of the stuff he saith it was not chosen for the good of the king but for their own turns and that very little of it fit to be put into any ship and much less into a great ship because it will be of no continuance and that he never knew pet to make any frame in the wood either for ship or boat who cannot do it being never brought up to it and as for his brother peter pet who was appointed purveyor he holdeth him a man most simple for such a purpose and also saith that though they be both unsufficient for the making of such a frame yet the badness of the stuff is not altogether to be imputed to them but to those who dispose of the business according to their own humour five days later bright came up for examination and was required to give answers to seventeen questions apparently the same as those put to baker six of them he did not answer but referred the commission to the answers given to them by baker his replies to the others were generally in corroboration of what baker had said but as regards pet's capability he expressed no direct opinion contenting himself with pointing out that quote, the old officers in former times in such great works did place two master shipwrights in the building of one great ship as my father mr bright was joined with mr pett in the building of the elizabeth jonas as also in the building of the bear with mr baker their reason was that two master shipwrights opinions was little enough for the charge so great in scope as she at woolwich will be but now it is carried by the favour of some of the officers to whom it pleaseth them but howsoever it is the charge is great for a young man to do which never made great ship before of that burthen after this the matter remained in abeyance until the end of march when northampton enlisted the service of george weymouth who appears to have possessed a great reputation among his contemporaries for his theoretical knowledge of shipbuilding in sixteen o two weymouth had set out under the auspices of the east india company to attempt the northwest passage in the discovery with another small vessel the godspeed but had been compelled through the mutiny of his crew to abandon the attempt after entering the strait subsequently known as hudson strait in sixteen o five he made a short voyage of discovery in the archangel along the american coast of actual experience in shipbuilding he seems at that time to have had none whatever and a perusal of his chapter on that subject in the manuscript volume the jewel of arts which he presented to james in sixteen o four should not inspire any great confidence in his theoretical knowledge but fortunately other means of judging the extent to which his knowledge was subsequently increased have lately presented themselves the chapter in the jewel of arts consists entirely of criticism together with a few crude drawings not explained in the text these criticisms are not without point as may be seen from the following extracts he says quote, although the form and fashion of these our english ships have always been and yet are accompted to be made by the best proportion and fittest both for service and burden yet if art and diligence were to the full performed in their buildings as they might there should not remain in them so many dangerous impediments as there do at this day which maketh me verily suppose that the one of them if not both is not in such measure in our shipwrights as with all my heart i do wish End quote. a little further on in speaking of the discrepancies to be found in ships supposed to be built from the same design he says quote, yet could i never see two ships builded of like proportion by the best and most skilful shipwrights in this realm the chiefest cause of their error is because they trust rather to their judgment than to their art and to their eye than to their scale and compass end quote. he then feeling no doubt that his want of technical experience in shipbuilding gave him small right to pose as a critic of the professional builders deprecates their censure in the following words quote, all which defects in building and many other i have with no less careful endeavour than with the often peril and hazard of mine own life diligently applied myself to search and find out even to the uttermost of my skill and understanding and although by mine own experience i can in this point speak as much as most seamen 
I might say, as any, having been employed in this service ever since I was able to do any, and served therein well near four apprenticeships, and having in this time borne all the offices belonging to this trade, even from the lowest unto the highest, yet had I rather that any other should have taken upon them the searching and finding out of these impediments, and the laying of them open, than myself, but seeing that no man that ever I heard of hath hitherto as yet undertaken the same, the thing being of much importance, as it is, and the danger so great, though perhaps I shall be hardly censured for the same of the shipwrights, whose want of art or diligence I therein accuse, yet do I think it the part of every good subject rather to seek to do good to the whole state than to fear the displeasure of any one occupation. End quote. In an undated paper, a copy of which is preserved in the Hylian manuscript, he further criticises the shipwrights to the following effect. Quote, the shipwrights of England and of Christendom build ships only by uncertain traditional precepts and observations, and chiefly by the deceiving aim of their eye, where for want of skill to work by such proportions as in art is required and is ever certain, I have found these defects. 1. No shipwright is able to make two ships alike in proportion, nor qualities, to build a ship to any desired burden certain, nor to propose to himself how much water his ship shall draw, until there be trial made thereof. 2. Ships yet built go not upright in the sea, whereby they often lose the use of their lower tier of ordnance. 3. They are often forced to be furred, which is a great charge and weakening to the ships. This is for want of skill to work their desired proportions. 4. They labour and beat in the sea more than they may be made to do, which causeth often leaks to spring, and weakeneth them, that they cannot last so long as they might. 5. They go not so near the wind as they might be made to do, the wind being the greatest advantage in fight. 6. They draw more water in proportion to their burdens than they might be made to do. 7. They be made of less burdens than they may be made of in proportion to the length, breadth, and depth. This defect the Hollanders have in part mended, and are able to carry freight for one-third part less than our merchants. 8. They cannot bear sail nor steer readily to make the best advantage of the wind, for want whereof, and of art in proportioning the moulds, they sail not so fast as they may be made to do. My study these twenty years in the mathematics hath been chiefly directed to the mending of these defects. I have during this time applied myself to know the several ways of building and the secrets of the best shipwrights in England and Christendom, and have likewise observed the several workings of ships in the sea in all the voyages I have been. By these helps I have demonstratively gained the science of making of ships perfect in art, which of necessity must be made wrought by a differing way from all the shipwrights in the world. End quote. He goes on to say that ships built after his plan would cost less and be of more burden, and gives reasons why the ships of the low countries carried freight at cheaper rates than English ships. This, he says, was because they were longer in proportion to their breadth broader and longer in the bottom, and therefore of less draught, and not built so high above water, with the result that they required less sail and tackling, and could manage with a smaller crew. These criticisms of the English shipwrights are no doubt well founded, but the step from critic to artist is a long one, and Weymouth never took it. Nevertheless, he was a more competent critic than Pett would have us believe. An anonymous 17th-century manuscript, entitled A Most Excellent Brief and Easy Treatise, containing, among other matters, a most excellent manner for the building of ships, exists in the Scott collection, and this, by the kindness of the owner, has been placed at the disposal of the editor, who, after a careful examination, has no doubt that it is the work of Weymouth, written after he had built the ship which Pett calls a Babel and Drown Divil and of which a midship section is given. Unfortunately, except in this one instance, 
the treatise is purely theoretical and throws no light on the problems of the prince royal or the methods of the royal shipwrights but as a theoretical treatise it is far in advance of the jewel of arts and indeed of anything that the english shipwrights of that century produced it is sufficient to explain why weymouth's opinions were accorded so much respect after weymouth's futile visit to woolwich the king seems to have been much perplexed and since there was no independent expert for they had all taken sides he handed the matter over to a committee composed of the lord high admiral and two of the great officers of the state in theory no doubt the selection of the admiral to superintend such an inquiry was the natural course to be followed but in this case he was sitting in judgment on one of his own protégés and could hardly condemn him without indirectly condemning himself and justifying northampton the result in such circumstances and with such a man was a foregone conclusion for the other two members having no professional experience of the matter would naturally follow his direction the technical arguments of baker and stevens would be lost on worcester and suffolk even if nottingham could appreciate them which may be doubted and judging by his writings and allowing for their ignorance of the mathematical side of the questions at issue it is not surprising that weymouth bored them beyond endurance with the result that in the end they found the business in every part and point so excellent northampton's anger at the result was not unnatural and the king found that there was no other course open to him but to hold an inquiry in person this was fixed for the eighth of may and during the first week of that month baker weymouth and their associates took the dimensions of the ship at woolwich and set out their objections in the following document imperfections found upon view of the new work begun at woolwich first her mould is altogether unperfect furred in diverse places she hath too much floor the lower sweep and the upper are too long and the middle sweep too short her depth is too great and her side too upright so that of necessity she must be tender-sided and not able to bear sail her breadth lieth too high and so she will draw too much water and thereby dangerous and unfit for our shoal seas her harpings are too round and lie too low which maketh a cling at the after end of it and makes the bow flare off so much that the work is not only misshapen but the ship dangerous to beat in the sea either at an anchor or under sail her workmanship is very ill done and thereby the ship made weak as first the limber holes are cut so deep in the midship floor timbers that they are less thickness upon the keel than toward the rung head whereas they ought to be thicker and stronger in the midst to bear the weight on ground the futtocks have not scarf enough with the floor timbers but at the lower end of them are diverse short clogs of timber put in which serve to no purpose for strength but to fill up the room every mean owner in the thames will assuredly tie the carpenter to allow a great scarf and to have his timber come whole within a foot of his kelson some of the timbers abaft and afore are left so deep by the kelson that the foot whales and outside not being well chenailed together will be great weakness to the ship and the rather for that the rung being cut out of right and old grown timber cannot be brought to a lesser scantling they will break in sunder at the cross grain the provision of timber was not fitting such a chargeable work for that much of the same is overgrown and many pieces of them cross-grained as cut to a roundness out of straight timber which cannot be strong enough to bear a ship on ground of so great weight as this as may be seen both in the ship and yard to show his weakness in art and the imperfection of the mould pet himself after workmen had seen her hauled down his futtocks two foot as soon as the lords were gone and cut off some of the heads of them whereby they have made her more imperfect than she was and put all things out of order that she can hardly be ever amended matthew baker nicholas clay john greaves george weymouth w bright edward stevens richard merriott all these being shipwrights saving captain weymouth have taken their oath and answered before us both upon their conscience to god their duty to the king and their love to their country that this declaration is true and captain weymouth also affirmeth that all which the said shipwrights have declared to be imperfections are so to be accounted 
but the error of the limber holes he did not look into supposing that no man affecting the name of a workman would err in so gross an absurdity h northampton e zouch john corbett charles parkins robert cotton captain weymouth further saith touching the imperfection of the mould that the hallowing moulds are not good neither before nor abaft for in the hollowing moulds afterward he hath taken away too much timber from the hooks whereby it hath much weakened the ship that when she cometh to lie on ground she will complain in that place which will be a great impediment to the ship and concludeth that she being so deep and her mould so unperfect with these gross errors and absurdities she can never be made strong and fit for service and least of all for our seas edward stevens george weymouth matthew baker w bright nicholas clay john greaves richard merriott h northampton e zouch charles parkins robert cotton john corbett this indictment cannot be lightly set aside baker was the most prominent shipbuilder of that day and bright and merriott or as the name is more usually written merritt were government shipbuilders of long experience while clay greaves and stevens were private builders of considerable standing in their profession unfortunately we have hardly any authentic details of the ship certainly not sufficient to enable us to form any independent opinion upon the question of her design we have from the careful survey taken in sixteen thirty two the following dimensions length of keel a hundred and fifteen feet breadth forty three feet mean breadth thirty six feet depth presumably from the breadth to top of keel eighteen feet depth from the ceiling sixteen foot three inches tonnage old measurement one thousand one hundred and eighty six eighty tonnage new measurement one thousand three hundred and thirty and from the arguments during the inquiry it appears that the breadth of the floor was eleven feet eight inches this is all we know of the shape of the hull below water and the pictures of the ship that can be considered authentic representations do not add to this knowledge it would seem that pett had made one or two slight alterations in the accepted rules as followed by his predecessors in the design of the hull for example his floor was slightly wider than the amount allowed by baker in his scheme for plotting the midship section given in the fragments of ancient english shipwrightry according to which it should have worked out at ten feet three inches but as weymouth had as we have already seen been advocating a broader floor a change that subsequently took effect it is difficult to understand why he at any rate should have objected to this to a later age which has seen much greater ships of deeper draught navigate our shoal seas in safety the objection to the deep draught of water may seem somewhat uncalled for but it must be remembered that at that date the king's ships when not on service lay in the medway above upner and an undated manuscript written about sixteen forty shows that difficulty was experienced in finding safe moorings for the sovereign and the prince in this position on the whole it seems probable that the objections on the score of design were not well founded we never hear of the ship having been crank or unseaworthy on this account and there is no such disgraceful episode as that connected with the unicorn built by edward boat in sixteen thirty three to be brought up against her End of section three.